I'll begin just by saying thank you to everybody for having us here today. Um, uh, I'm Ben Wessler, my collaborator David Kent is uh, on the line too, and um, we'll be sharing this presentation to um, show you some of the work we're doing here on predictive models at Tufts Medical Center, and as well share some of the results from the Proteus study that was conducted last year within the Odyssey community. Um, we'll uh, go back and forth with this talk, see uh, how well we can figure this out or screw it up, and uh, thanks for bearing with uh, me, I'll say me, because I'm a simple uh, cardiologist, so um, I consistently screw up the tech arena. So thanks for your patience. Um, we work here in the uh, Predictive Analytics and Comparative Effectiveness Center uh, at Tufts Medical Center, um, and uh, I take care of patients uh, at Tufts Medical Center. I'm a non-invasive cardiologist and uh, echocardiographer. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, so so uh, what we'll walk through today is an example of, of how I use predictions uh, in the clinic. I have clinic this afternoon. Um, a few of the examples we've been working on, um, uh, sort of a different lens to think about the use of these models. Uh, we'll discuss some independent external validations that our group has done and then share with you the results from uh, the Odyssey efforts uh, from your group. You can go to the next slide. So the, the framework for us as we approach clinical predictive models uh, is presented here that as it stands now, there's no standard evaluation framework for how predictive models are uh, studied. And once they're produced and tested once, on an external data set, it's often presumed that the predictions are both trustworthy and accurate. And secondarily, it's assumed that the decisions that leverage outputs from predictive models are better than decisions that are made without using these predictive tools. And there's some evidence to say the last is not true. Next slide. So the case I'll give you just to orient folks is heart failure. It's a clinical condition. It's very common um, and morbid and expensive. We can go to the next slide. And predictive models have been integrated into the care of these patients. So I have two hypothetical patients presented here. Patient A on the left has a certain set of clinical features uh, or covariates. Patient B has a separate set. And there are predictive models that can be used to estimate the risk for these patients. Uh, and um, using predictive models in this setting, if you go to the next the slide, uh, has become central to certain decisions that are made. We can move to the next slide. I have a slide here titled uh, CPM Performance and Dis Discrimination. And to orient to the two domains of model performance we look at, the first most folks are familiar with, which is discrimination, which is represented by a C-statistic. And the C statistic, as a reminder, can range from 1 to 0.5. And 0.5 is a useless model. It's as good as a coin flip, where 1 is perfect discrimination. Patients are perfectly ordered on uh, the probability that they have the event of interest. Next slide. The other domain that has been underreported systematically in the literature is calibration. And that, broadly speaking, is how well uh, predicted rates match observed range for populations. We can go to the next slide. And we've studied a, a series of predictive models uh, in congestive heart failure. And what we've found is that uh, both metrics of performance, uh, calibration and discrimination, uh, can be uh, uh, significantly worse than expected. I don't know if you can advance the uh, this is a, a slide of external validations of three predictive models. The predictive models are on the leftmost column. The uh, C statistic or error under the receiver operating curve, as published in the original presentation of these models, was around 0.75 to 0.77. And what we see as these models are tested uh, across different databases and different world regions, 
is that performance appears to be much worse than expected. And when we look at calibration with the model as applied as published, uh, there is a severe miscalibration where expected uh, predi predicted probabilities are dramatically different than observed event rates in subsequent populations. And the box on the bottom left is shown just to identify the idea that the conditions for these models to uh, have the best performance are different across different databases across the world. So uh, one size does not fit all. We can go to the next slide. So we have a predictive model registry here, uh, the Tufts Pace CPM registry that has identified all of the available predictive models uh, in, for cardiovascular disease that have been published. We'll go to the next slide. And one of the things that we have seen is a dramatic increase in the frequency of publication. Predictive models are available for uh, a large number of cardiovascular conditions, predicting a number of clinical types of events. And um, then the, the, the publication of these models is increasing exponentially. Next slide. We've recently completed work uh, to look at all of the predictive models in our database and identify external validations that have been done of those models that have been published and to see how performance changes in those external validations. Next slide. So for over 1,300 predictive models, we found the following. Only 42% of the models have ever been externally validated. On average, there was one and a half validations per predictive model. And the distribution of available external validations is highly skewed. For example, one model was externally validated 94 times. And if you go to the next slide, this is sort of the big takeaway from this prior work that motivated the Odyssey work, which is that there is uh, extreme heterogeneity in performance of predictive models across different databases. So on the top column, for the top row, we have the logistic Euro score, which was validated 94 times. And if you look in the far right, the range in validation AUC, this is the ability, uh, this is the discriminatory ability. And these external validations ranges from useless to near perfect. And there's nothing unique about that model that is seen across these databases, across these models. That performance heterogeneity is the rule for these models, not the exception. Next slide. So overall from this work, uh, we found that calibration, sort of this domain of how uh, well predictions match observed event rates is systematically underreported. And in fact, for the majority of models in our database, there is no understanding of model calibration in external data sets. Next slide. So we've seen that uh, there's been a tremendous proliferation and redundancy of predictive models with very limited uh, attention to external validation. About 60% of published models have never been externally validated uh, and half of them have only been validated only once. And uh, the general approach now, which is that a single external validation uh, supports uh, validity and use is probably insufficient to guide decisions about use and performance because isolated validations do not predict subsequent performance on new databases. You can go to the next slide. I think I may uh, turn it over to David after this last comment, which is that uh, this work raises concerns about the current approach to validating predictive models and requires us to think about 
a new way to explore performance heterogeneity and how to quantify it uh, before we can think about using predictive models to inform care. So as we move to the next slide, I'm gonna try to bring David in and see if you guys can hear him. So uh, I'll look at Andrew. Andrew, can you hear me? Okay, and uh, okay, so great, terrific. So I guess uh, Ben introduced me to introduce the limitations of his prior work. That's very kind of you, Ben. So a major limitation of Ben's work is that model performance uh, is not generally presented in a way that makes it clear whether a given clinical predictive model is likely to improve or worsen decision making. So we know discrimination um, might go down, we know calibration might be off, but we don't know uh, what's good enough and what's not. Okay. Um, and one of the major reasons why that's true is, is, as I said, because discrimination is our major is 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 the major major measurement that's used in the literature to evaluate model performance and it's just uh, incomplete as as a as a metric um, next slide so uh, I, I should say at the beginning this work was all sponsored uh, by a PCORI methods grant and it had two parts one part was the part that uh, Ben described which was a, an evaluation of the literature and the other part was um, a set of independent validations that we did because of the limitations of the literature. Namely, um, really, they only looked at the C statistic, and um, there were many models that only had single validations. Next slide. So we performed a set of independent validations on a set of clinical prediction models. We selected three index conditions, acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, and incident cardiovascular disease. And we used publicly available clinical trial data and an evaluation framework. Next slide. Uh, advance, please. You can advance through the, uh, and again, okay, right there. And, and what was um, useful about our evaluation framework is that it included novel measures that addressed some of the prior limitations. So uh, one novel measure we used was a model-based C, C statistic. And what that does is it standardizes uh, for the case mix. So if you take a model that had a C statistic of 0.8 and you test it on a new population and it goes down to 0.75, the reason it went down could be either uh, the model was overfit and not, you know, fully valid. Some of the estimates were incorrect. Or it could just be that in the new database, there was a more homogeneous population, right? So the more heterogeneous pop your, your population, when, when I'm talking about heterogeneity, I'm talking about heterogeneity of risk. If you have a more heterogeneous population, your model will have a higher C statistic. If you have a more homogeneous population, your model will have a, a lower C statistic without any change in model validity. So using a model-based C statistic gives you a benchmark to understand that. And we'll see examples of this. The other thing we did is we used numerical measures of calibration, which are, are very rare in the literature. Typically when calibration is reported, the hosmer lemeshow statistic is reported, and that's just delivers a p-value that's totally uninterpretable clinically. If you have a very large database, your p-value will be small. If you have a small database, your p-value will be large. It doesn't really give you good information. Carroll's E average uh, really gives you the, uh, it's meant to be a quantitative estimate of the difference between the observed and uh, the expected, the, the observed and the predicted values. Where the observed value for a binary outcome is is um, estimated through a, a low S smooth curve. So, um, and again, we'll see we'll, we'll see exam examples of that. And the last thing 
that we used is something called decision curve analysis. And I'm actually going to spend a little time on decision curve analysis because this is a measure that integrates everything. And of these measures, it's really the only one that addresses the question we're interested in. Is this model likely to improve decisions and improve outcomes? Um, it integrates uh, discrimination, it integrates calibration, and it takes account also of the utility of the outcomes you're trying to present. Next slide. So the, the problem with the performance measures, the statistical accuracy performance measures we ge generally use, is that, that they only assess the quality of the predictions. They don't assess the quality of the decisions. Decision curve analysis does that. And, and for example, an ROC, a C statistic, it treats sensitivity and specificity, that should say specificity, there's a mistake in the slide, as equally important. And that doesn't make that that's uh, clinically that doesn't make sense because next slide. We know generally false negatives are worse than false positives. And we'll start with the case example on the right. So if I'm trying, so this is a gentleman, let's say he's 80 years old, he's coming to the emergency room with a little chest pain. He might have a heart attack in which case I want to admit him to the hospital. He might have dyspepsia, in which case I could send him home with a pill. So um, the question is, what's the probability that it is a heart attack? So let's say I think, well, this is probably not a heart attack. Let's say I think there's a 51% probability that this is not a heart attack. There's a 49% probability that it is a heart attack. The question, um, I'll pick on Andrew. Um, can I send him home? I think it's probably not a heart attack. There's, a, there's only, you know, there's a 51% chance that's, that it's a heart attack. A 51% chance that it's not a, a heart attack, a 49% chance that it is. So in all likelihood, it's not a heart attack. I can send him home right. Is that right? I, I know you. I know you're a PhD, not an MD, but okay. Uh, so, Miss Lee, you can answer. I said it depends. <laughs> it depends. Okay. Well, it depends is almost always a good answer, but in this case, not really. You you would not send someone home from the emergency room with a 49% chance of a heart attack, right? You probably wouldn't send someone home with a 40% chance of a heart attack. You probably wouldn't send someone home with a 30% chance of a heart attack. And all that illustrates, so you're 70% sure that it's not a heart attack, you still wouldn't send them home. All that indicates is what the title in the slide shows, is that false negatives are generally worse than false positives. So. Uh, your threshold is rarely 50-50. In fact, for chest pain, your threshold might be 2%. That if a person has a 3% chance of having a heart attack, we're still going to admit them because the consequences of a mistake, if it is a false negative, are really bad. So if you say your threshold is 2%, what that means is a false negative is 49 times worse than a false positive. The reason I get that is because it's two versus 98. So that's a ratio of one to 49. So a false, just by picking that threshold, that that implicitly weights uh, the, 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 the utility of a, of a false positive versus a false negative. The picture on the right is a transrectal prostate biopsy which is an uncomfortable procedure that has some harm and some consequences. And you would only do it on a patient who has some risk of prostate cancer. You wouldn't do it on, on um, patients with a zero risk of prostate cancer. 
And so in this case, maybe you'd want to do a procedure like this on somebody who has at least a 10% risk of prostate cancer. And so your decision threshold might be around 10%. Okay. And again, what that's saying is that a false negative, not doing a biopsy on someone with prostate cancer is about nine times as bad as doing a prostate biopsy on somebody without. So it's a higher threshold because the consequence, in this case, you're putting someone through uh, a very uncomfortable, expensive, and uh, potentially harmful procedure. Uh, and the thing you're detecting, especially if they're old, may not be something that, that um, harms the patient, prostate cancer, if someone's older. And that threshold can move. It might not be 10% for all patients. In an older patient, it might be 20%. In a younger or more anxious patient, it might be 5%. So, so that threshold you're picking does two things. Next slide. Okay, and these are the two things it does. So if you select a threshold, let's say 10%, it defines what a positive test is. Above 10% is positive, below 10% is negative, right? That will also determine what your sensitivity and specificity are. Okay. And finally, it determines the relative utility of a false positive versus a false negative. So the relative utility is the P over one minus P, the PT over one minus PT. That's the relative utility. So for a threshold of 10%, that Relative utility is one ninth. It's basically the exchange rate, the value of a false positive compared to a true positive. And the difference between those two terms is, is, is your net benefit. You don't have to calculate net benefit over a single threshold. Instead, what you do is you calculate net benefit over a range of thresholds. So in this case, for prostate cancer, it might be from a range of 5% to a range of 20% something like that and then you can see whether your model is better than another model or whether your model is better than treating everybody or treating nobody next slide so here are two calibration curves model a on the left model b on the right and they're both for selecting patients uh, for prostate cancer and, and and if you see model a has a c statistic or an a you see of 0 0.82, 0 0.819, but it's not that well calibrated. It's, see, it's it's under predicting for some, especially the ones at, at lower risk, or risk less than 20%, it's, it's, it's under predicting their risk. Um, the model B, on the other hand, has a, a slightly worse C statistic, 0.79. So that's not a trivial difference. Uh, but it seems to be a little better calibrated, especially in this area that we thought was important, which is the 10% mark, right? If we said a threshold was a 10%. Which model is better, model A or model B? So I've been doing predictive modeling for, for a long time, 20 years or so, and I can tell you that I can't tell from looking at this information which model is better. Um, one has, you know, I just can't tell. Uh, I, I think the conventional um, answer would be model A is better than model B because the C statistic is higher. 0 0.82 versus 0 0.79. That's not a totally trivial difference, that three points from a baseline of 0.5. So let's look at the decision curves, see what we see. Next slide. This is a decision curve. Net benefit is on the y axis. Okay, and the threshold probability is on the x-axis. So, which model is better, first of all, depends on what our threshold probability is. If our threshold probability is about 15%, you can see model B is better than model A, okay, and better than a treat-all strategy, say biopsying everybody, okay. Um, and so model B, remember, was the one with the lower C statistic. It's better than model A, probably because it was better calibrated. 
especially for you know higher thresholds. But even around the threshold of 0.1, it's still uh, you know they're roughly equivalent around the threshold of 0.1. Interestingly, if our threshold is really low at five percent or less, we're actually better off not using either model. We're better off just biopsying everybody. Okay, and because by picking a low threshold, we're saying we really don't want to miss any prostate cancer. And it turns out that these, neither of these models are good enough to tell us to, to accurately select people with a risk of less than 5%. They can't do it. And so we're better off biopsying everybody. Okay? Um, and, and, and so if your threshold is that low, then that's the definition of harm being caused by a model. This mo using either of these models would cause harm relative to just biopsy everybody. Next slide. Okay, sorry about the slide. I'm, I'm gonna try to finish up a little quicker, but this is just to, to uh, emphasize the fact that people make the mistake of thinking decision curves help you pick the best decision threshold. They don't. You have to pick the decision threshold first, and then the curve will tell you if your model is, is, is helping you, okay? And uh, this was a, a funny meme I sent out. Since this is a Zoom meeting, I can pretend everybody is laughing. Um, why don't you advance the slide, please? So the, the, this just slide shows, so decision curve is not useful for picking a threshold, but it is useful for revealing the fact that models can be harmful. And these are two models that are miscalibrated, and you can see that yellow are thresholds for which either model will cause harm. This is just a schematic. So the model on the left causes harm if your thresholds are at high risk. The model on the right causes harm if for thresholds that are low risk or that are very high risk. And there's a pattern that we see when we do these, and that is, um, in both of these cases, the prevalence of the outcome is 20%. And if your threshold is near the prevalence, then that's an easier place for your model actually to help you make a decision. If your threshold are far from the prevalence, then, then you tend to run into some more problems. Next slide. Okay, so, so back to the work we did. That was all just background. Um, we did these decision curve analyses and these other novel uh, 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 measures on, on three different index conditions, coronary syndrome, heart failure, and incident cardiovascular disease. And we used publicly available clinical trials. And, um, next slide. These are the trials, the 36 clinical trials in each um, distributed across the three index conditions. Next slide. We, we went to our PACE registry, we looked at all the models in these three index conditions, we matched them to the database. One of the things we found is it was really hard to match the models to the databases. And, and, but we ended up finding 108 unique CPMs to test. We tested them 158 times. Here are our results. Next slide. Top line, okay, development C statistic. On average across these 158, well, Across these 108 models, the development C statistic, let's look at the median, the middle column, 0 0.76. That was a typical C statistic. When we tested that on our databases, the validation C statistic, third line down, was 0 0.64. The typical one was 0 0.64. That's a big drop. That's a 12 point drop. That's about a 50% drop in discrimination. Okay, because the baseline is 0 0.5. But if you see the middle line there, that top column, validation model base C statistic is 0 0.68. And what that's telling us is that half the drop is just due to the fact that we have different case mix. These models were developed on registries, we're testing them on clinical trials. And that homogeneity leads to the drop. Uh, if we go down to the bottom three lines, that talks about calibration. You can see the standardized D, which is the middle 
rho there. So if we look at the median, it's 0 0.5. That tells us that our errors are large. They're about 50% of the prevalence. Okay, but still, we're unable to identify. So we know there's a drop in the C statistic. We know calibration is a little off. But are they, should we use these models? We, we don't know until we do the decision curve analysis. Next slide. So this is what we found with decision curve analysis. If we look at the original model, the top three lines, let's look if the threshold is right at the prevalence. Now, recall that we said this was the area that it's that models typically help in the most when you're decision, and I we could talk about why that is, but if your decision threshold is near the average risk, then the model is usually helpful. You can see that 85.6% of the time, the net benefit of the model is positive. Okay? I hope everybody sees that. But if we go to half the prevalence, which is right the line right above that, we see that the net benefit was positive. In other words, the model was helpful only 28.8% of the time. And if we move all the way to the column on the far right, we see that when the decision threshold was that low, half the prevalence, 50% of the time, the model was actually causing harm. And 50%, 43.9% of the time, if the decision threshold was quite high, the model also had a risk for harm. If we stay in that right-sided column, which is the risk of harm, that's the prevalence, the proportion of models causing harm at a given threshold. We see that if we update the intercept, um, we now totally eliminate the risk of harm from when our decision threshold is at the prevalence, and we slightly decrease the risk of harm when the decision pref prevalence is uh, when the decision threshold is at kind of a more extreme level. And if we update both the intercept and the slope, then we make substantial uh, gains in terms of reducing the risk of harm. We're kind of less than 20%. The risk of harm is less than 20% at any of the three decision thresholds we look at. Uh, next slide. So these are our results. And um, I guess the only thing I'll say is that the blue dots represent non-harmful models. Red dots represent harmful models. You can see the southeast quadrant is where the non-harmful models are. So if you see statistic is above 0.7 and your standardized error is less than 0.3, that's a 30% 30, 30 error or so, then your decision curve analysis is generally going to show that your risk of harm is relatively low. But if it's anywhere else, it's high. Next slide. Skip over this one. Next slide. So it turned out that you know there were 22 blue dots, if you look at the upper, upper left corner, and 110 red dots, meaning that 110 out of 132 of the models, at least at one of those three thresholds, was causing harm, which was surprising to us. As we updated the intercept, we moved from the upper left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner, and the, the, the dots uh, went down, the calibration improved, and many of the red dots turned blue. So now we have, instead of 22 red uh, blue dots, we have 53 blue dots. These are safe ones. And then if we updated the slope and the intercept, then the dots went down further and more of the red dots turned blue. Now we have 87 safe and beneficial models and only 45 with potential harm. This kind of summarizes all the, you know, a lot of the work we've, we've done. I want to leave time for Ben. Next slide. So I don't have any, uh, I don't have a conclusion slide, but I'll just summarize very briefly that, you know, the potential for harm just seems much more common than we anticipated when we looked at these models. Now, there might be reasons why the samples we used led to models that didn't perform well, but we were really surprised that it was just so common that models could, pour, um, could produce harm. And we wouldn't have known if we didn't do the decision curve analysis. 
And then the third thing that we learned was recalibration really substantially reduces the risk of harm. If your model is re, uh, recalibrated, uh, that's what protects your, uh, your, your um, model from doing harm. I'll turn it over to Ben. Great, thanks so much. So um, we can go to the next slide uh, and I'll sort of share the, the Odyssey results. So this Proteus study that we did with the help from mo many folks on the call focuses on um, uh, cholesterol, which is a modifiable risk factor for the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And it's treatable with a class of medications called statins. And a risk prediction uh, is central to the decision-making uh, for use of statins in the primary prevention space, so people who have not had stroke or heart attack. Next slide. Um, on the left are uh, my clinical guidelines. On the right is the uh, iPhone app that I can use. And in the bottom left is the statement about risk. There's an equation called the pooled cohort equation, um, which is uh, available to estimate an individual's 10-year risk of experiencing a stroke or an MI. And there's a risk threshold that has been uh, adopted with uh, some disagreement and um, uh, strong opinions, but there's a threshold of 7.5% over 10 years. So if you are above that threshold, you should be on a statin. If you are below that threshold, you should not. Next slide. So the work that was done uh, with this group uh, spread across the world with a number of databases. And the design of this work was similar to the design of the work we've presented, which is that a model exists. And we set out to see how well it performed uh, across these different databases uh, with available data. Next slide. This is a sort of top level view of these databases that were able to be run and some of the variables that are in uh, the pooled cohort risk equation. On average, uh, you can see that patients were in their 40s to 50s, and about half of them were male. Next slide. And this is the top result. Um, this is an example of the top results. If, if you were looking for my risk, so this model is stratified uh, based on sex and race. But if you take a look at the top two columns for these uh, markers of performance, they're instructive. The headers uh, I'll run through. So the database name is on the far left. Then the number of outcomes followed by the total number of patients in these databases. Uh, the uh, C statistic is the AUC and the Delta AUC represents the change from uh, the originally published C statistic. A positive number in the DAUC uh, column indicates a drop in discriminatory performance. A negative number uh, indicates an increase above apparent discrimination that is better than the as published discrimination. We then have the observed event rates across these databases. And these measures of calibration, the average error, the 90th percentile error, and the net benefit at the threshold of interest, which here is presented for three-year follow-up. So it's a risk of having one of these events that's at 2.25%. And if you look at the, the top database, you'll see that the AUC here was 0.82, which represents a 28% improvement in discriminatory performance compared to the uh, as published C statistic for this subset of patients, which was 0.75. But if you look at the next row down, the C statistic is 
which represents a 30% loss of discriminatory performance. And the take home point from these two slides, and as you look down, you can see is that discriminatory performance varies substantially across these da different databases. And if you look way to the right, you can go to the next slide. We can see that the net benefit for some of these models actually indicates that the models would motivate harmful decision making at the threshold of interest. And if we drill down to the two validations that demonstrate harm at this threshold, we see that the standardized error rates are enormous. Over 100% of what the prevalence of the outcome is. That's the CPRD and the IPCI. So with large error rates, with mi substantial miscalibration, these models can lead to harmful decisions. There's another, uh, the top row demonstrates a, a very large error rate, an average error rate uh, of almost 100% higher than the prevalence. But that is not harmful, and that's probably because it's associated with very high discriminatory performance, the AUC of 0.82. And so excellent discrimination can guard against some of the potential harm in the setting of the severely miscalibrated models. I don't show, but I will report that when you recalibrate these, when you update either the intercept or the interceptor slope, the errors decrease and uh, no models have uh, potential for harm around the threshold of interest. You can go to the next slide. I think we're fin we're finishing up and we're happy to take any questions. So there are a few reasons why model performance might decrease or increase. One is that the, the with respect to decreasing, models can be overfit to the population that they were derived on. And then here's a reference for the description about how case mix can really affect the apparent performance uh, with respect to discrimination. Next slide. These are our conclusions. So uh, this Odyssey work showed that measures of performance are highly variable when you take a model and test it in different populations. And that for databases where the pooled cohort equation was highly miscalibrated, model use to support decisions in the clinic, where I'm going to go in about 15 minutes, could motivate harmful decisions. But if you recalibrate these, this model uh, set to the population it's being used on, you can guard against that harm. Is there one more slide? I think there's one more slide. Yeah, one more. We can go there now. So this is just a note of thanks that probably should have come first. This is a, was a study unlike anything I've been a part of, and it, really an extraordinary group of people came together we call out a few of them here, but there were well over 200 folks involved. And um, I think I'll stop with that. Uh, it's incredible what you guys are doing. The data are quite interesting. Um, and uh, we're happy to take any questions um, at this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben and David. That was excellent. And uh, if you can see through the chat, certainly a lot of questions have come up. I know we are at the top of the hour, but if anyone wants to stay a couple extra minutes and ask a couple questions, we don't want to hold Ben up from his clinical time. But uh, if there are any questions, if anyone wants to raise their hand and uh, we'll try to just get in a couple questions if people want to stay. As a reminder, we will post this recording on the community calls page afterwards. Uh, Harold, I saw your hand up. You can go. Yeah, first of all, this is fantastic. And um, as I wrote, it just to get from data all the way to clinical decision making is uh, a dream uh, for, for many people for decades. And especially the Tufts folks where Steve Pauker hails from, this is like his bread and butter if you don't know him. Is there any thought to how the semantics of the data in these different databases may contribute to the error that you're and the variability that you're seeing. 
So we, we, we know that the data are the, the we know that the concept IDs are are correct, but is there any very good? So, so Ben, did you hear that? Part? Question better than I did, or I, I had a hard time. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll repeat it and then make one comment, and then David, you can chime in. So, uh, Harold asked whether or not the semantics of how data uh, exist in these different databases, uh, how that plays into the observed performance of these models when they're tested. And I'll begin, Harold, by saying that there is a tremendous interest in this issue, and I think it is. Uh, of incredible importance. Um, and the way that, number one, concepts are assigned, but then also how uh, cohorts are assembled and outcomes are defined uh, are all incredibly impactful to how these models look when they're evaluated. Um, David, do you want to say more about that? Yeah, well, you know, I could just underscore what Ben said. Uh, you know, it's an astute question, first of all. And, you know, when we talk about external validity, sometimes that's decomposed into two different ideas. One is generalizability, and the other is transportability. Generalizability, you know, basically says, does uh, do our results translate to other populations that are similar, similar but different? Transportability really gets to the fact that sometimes you want your models to perform well on groups that are non-overlapping with who you derive your model on. And in a way, a lot of these issues point to the fact that some of the measure, the, the, the way you know billing practices are, the way diagnostic codes are used, the way phenotypes are assigned, are just totally different from one database to the next. And people don't think about that often when they're validating models. There's just uh, differences in measurement. So the, the um, equation we use, the pooled cohort equation, that was developed on a bunch of different cohorts that had research-grade data and research-grade ascertainment for the covariates, the, the, um, um, the uh, uh, and the outcomes and the labels. So, um, both the features and the labels had really research grade ascertainment. And when you take that to the EHR data, you just should not expect the same level of performance. Um, and, you know, uh, as you said, from, from one database to, a, to another, just the measurement problems, I think, will vary and that will also affect um, model performance. All right, looks like that's all the questions that we have. So a reminder again, we will post this recording uh, later on. Uh, there were some great questions in the chat. I don't know if Ben and David, if you were able to see any of those, but you should have access to that afterwards. If you want to answer any of those, those stay uh, with everybody. Uh, but otherwise, again, thank you so much, Ben and David, for this presentation and to everybody in the community for their work on this effort. Uh, we will see you next week for our work group presentations. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.